get rid of it. Cool. God, I don't even know how I look. Maybe I should turn that around so I can figure out how I look. Hey Junior Archaeologist, welcome to another episode of Happy Archaeology Fun Time. Today we're going to answer the question, I guess it's a series of questions, but um, we're going to answer what is the business behind archaeology? Some of the things you don't ever hear about when you're at the field tech level. With me today is my special guest, Chris Webster, again. Yo. <laughs> let's see, owner, let's see, owner of Dig Tech and other enterprises. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, um, moderator of a couple of Facebook groups. Let's see, writer of a blog, writer of a book, which I forget which name escapes me at the moment. The Field Archaeologist Survival Guide. Oh, that's right. Available from Amazon and Left Coast Press. Oh, you're forgetting Kindle. Oh, yeah, and it's on Kindle now. Well, that's <laughs> Amazon. That's true. Yeah. But, you know, people might think it's still a book. That's true. Paper book. Anyway, and what else is there? Oh, and he can be found at Archaeowebby on Twitter. Absolutely. All right. So, question one. Let's see. I guess the. I don't know what the hell is a proposal. <laughs> well, I keep hearing about them. So proposals are how you win contracts, ah. uh, which we'll talk about in yeah. the future. Um, a proposal is essentially. It can be a number of things. Um, sometimes a proposal is just a uh, something that says who you are what you're capable of and a single line in a column that says how much you plan to uh, how much you're bidding for the project um, it just depends on what the client or agency asks for in the proposal and you have to read the RFP they call it or RFQ which is request oh. for proposal or request for quote um, uh. and there's other terms too but those are the two common ones is that where people is that where people get the misimpression that people underbid on stuff or correct impression well this is this is where the underbidding would happen is in the proposal um, or you know this is where the bid happens so uh, but the problem is you have to look and see it depends on the agency you're talking about yeah um, if you're talking about some private client there's yeah. a good chance that they're just gonna go with the lowest bidder no no questions asked yeah. um, if you're talking about a, a federal agency like the BLM then they like to say the words best value <laughs> and best value is an incredibly loaded term and it could be it could be really anything. Um, my company is new, and yeah. therefore, one of the big pro proposal requirements of past performance, yeah. which which doesn't mean, hey, I've done surveys in this area. Um, it means my company has done surveys in this area of this similar type within the last like three years, and you have to put that down. And but then, where how do companies that are crap keep getting work if their past performance is crap? <laughs> well, they they have past performance though. They have those projects. They don't tell the BLM how well they did on those projects. They just have to list them. Say, listen, we did this, we did this, we did this, and we have all this equipment. So they look really good on paper. Um, no one can even bother calling or asking. Well, I don't, I don't know that they do. Uh, you'd have to get a BLM archaeologist on for that. But uh, So when they talk about best value, that's, that's what happens. That's why proposal writing is tricky. Um, and you can't always just assume that you're going to have the lowest price will win, especially for those types of contracts, because um, I was partnered with another firm last yeah. fall. We lost two contracts to the same firm, very similar types of surveys, but the BLM didn't know who we were, so they didn't give them to us. Oh, I and, was uh, one of those surveys. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's working for the enemy. So, well, in, in, on one of them, they, they bid uh, yeah. way less than we did, and on one of them, they bid more than we did. Uh. But they, according to the BLM, were the best of value. So it wasn't just the lowest price. Um, yeah. So, yeah, when you're when you're writing your proposal, the biggest thing to the biggest thing the company has to look at is what are the requirements. Uh. Sometimes they'll even have an outline that your proposal has to follow. It has yeah. to be this very specific format. And sometimes for some of the um, federal agencies, you yeah. actually turn in two proposals. One of them is. Uh, um, a cost proposal, yeah. and one of them is a. Uh, ah. um, one of them is a cost proposal, and yeah. one of them basically is just your your 
your company's qualities and attributes you know what your capabilities what 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 kind of equipment do you have what personnel do you have what's your plan for this project um, uh, and then they'll have two independent teams yeah. read each proposal and then that way the cost people aren't looking at what you're going to do they're just looking at cost to see if it's a good value uh -huh. they'll score it and then the the other team will look at this independent of cost and say, yeah. well, we don't know how much you're going to charge, but you're going to do a real good job on this project, so we'll score you this way. And then they just combine the scores and see who wins. Huh. So, um, so when it comes to, like, a private client, you never, it's a wild west, man. You never know yeah. what they're going to do. So <laughs> It's about who you know. Yeah, really. Wait, is it, let's see. Oh, I guess those are most salient points for a field tech, unless there are any others you can think of. Yeah, I mean, field techs like to say that Companies underbid, companies underbid, yeah. companies underbid, uh, and there's, that's not incorrect. Um, I would say that companies do whatever they can to try to win the job. Yeah. And in some cases, I would be willing to bet there's somebody at the top that's just greedy and is just trying to get more work. But in most cases, they're trying to make payroll for their salaried employees. Yeah. You know, some of these companies are really stressed out, and they've got to have, you know, they've got to make fifty thousand dollars a month just to break even. Yeah, so, I mean, people just, just like field techs just assume this money comes from the CI or something. Yeah. It has to come from somewhere. I know, and, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not trying to say that you know everybody's on the up and up and everybody's uh, you know uh -huh. ethical, but in most cases, I would say that companies are really just trying to pay the bills, yeah. and the one big part of the proposal where you can save save money <laughs> is to uh, is to cut down on the billable rate. For field techs, because oh. that's your biggest cost on the proposal. Your biggest, your biggest part of the proposal is your field work. Unless you've got like a data recovery or something that's complicated, then you might have, yeah. you know, months of lab work or something like that, and that could oh. actually take up a lot of time too. Well, um, I mean, like the project we're on right now, like the lab work's going to take longer than our field work. Right. Exactly. So, I would say on data recovery projects, um, the field work is probably one of the least expensive parts, unless yeah. you're throwing a ton of people at it. Yeah. If you're trying to get it done in a month and it's huge and you throw 50 people at it, that's going to be expensive. Your payroll is going to be 100 to 150 grand one month. Although in certain regions, it's kind of hard to drop the billable rate. I mean, <laughs> that's a certain point because, you know, you need to pay a certain amount of wages. Otherwise, they're going to get scooped up by someone else if the work's too hard. Yeah, so when they drop the billable rate, and the billable rate just means, let's say, you're, you as a field tech are being yeah. charged to the client at, say, $55 an hour. That's really typical out here in the West. Yeah. I think it's less back east, but um, out here in the west it's 50 to $60 an hour, and out of that billable rate come your wages, but yeah. your wages have all kinds of other stuff attached to it, workers' comp, all that uh, stuff needs to be paid for, and all that's factored in. So let's say you're getting $15 an hour, <laughs> now you're, at, at fit, from 55 and 15 now you've got $40 to play with, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you take out workers' comp, you take out their legal fees, you mm -hmm. take out their accountants, you take out the, the rental fees for the building, the insurance for the vehicle mm -hmm. you're riding in, all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, you take all that stuff out, and now you're, you're cutting into that $40, and whatever's left yeah. is profit. Ah. That's where profit comes from. Whatever's <laughs> left is profit. So when they start saying, when they don't, if they don't want to change the rate that the field tech's getting paid, yeah. which most companies will try to keep that constant mm -hmm. um you know they'll try to be structured on that yeah when they start trying to win projects and cut down that billable rate they're really just cutting into their profit because they can't they can't take away their other bills hmm. you know you um know. they can if they get more efficient but yeah. that's a different conversation well you know i was i mean i don't know i didn't write down this question where the hell do bonuses come from <laughs> companies that do really well i mean they they can uh I mean, bonuses come from profits, pure and simple. Um, uh. Unless, I, I guess it's conceivable that a company could actually um, add a certain percentage point to their billable rates yeah. and say this is going to pay bonuses at the end of the year, uh. um, or something like that. Is my guess is it normally comes from profits, though. Yeah. Um, you, you just you just decide that a certain percentage of your profits for that yeah. year will go to bonuses, and then you'll have a complicated formula for figuring out who gets yeah. what. Usually based on what your position is, what your hourly rate is, huh. you know, how you contributed to the company. Wait, do you know how it worked at the company we both used to work for? Nobody knows how it worked at that company. Oh, it's just magic? Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's based on, it's based on profits, unless they build it in, um, and they just have it as an expense, but it should be based on profits, and, um, and it's, it's a formula. You know, I don't know if they tell you that formula. I never found out the formula, ah. but... Chances are they won't tell you the formula because they want your bonus to be a big surprise. Um, I, I want to do things differently if I get big enough. I want to. I want you. I want you to know 
exactly what your bonus is going to be because oh. you have the ability to increase it. And yeah. it's not just, it's tied to profits, the ultimate amount that's available, yeah. but the percentage of that that you get is completely up to you and, yeah. and my structure. So. Well, you know, I once was on a project for an unnamed company, company <laughs> <laughs> and they told us to stop popping tires because they cut into, the, because, you know, it cut into someone's bonus. Right. <laughs> and that didn't sound right to me, although I might be wrong. Well, it's not, it's not right directly. Um, it's not cutting into someone's bonus. If you're popping tires uh, and the company doesn't have, say, an emergency field budget or something like that, they don't they don't write into all their contracts a certain yeah. percentage for just miscellaneous vehicle repairs and things like that. And yeah. They can't charge it to the client. If you can't charge something to the client, it comes out of your profit. Huh. So if it's coming out of your profit, then it is cutting into a bonus, oh. theoretically. So. Cool. Yeah, but that was a pretty mean thing to say on a project because chances are the temporary hire field techs weren't getting bonuses anyway, so why no. should they care? <laughs> I didn't care at all. <laughs> like at all. Got yeah, it. you probably don't give it a crap that your no. your project manager is not going to get his or her bonus. No, so. I mean, if they had allowed me to drive, I would have popped more tires. <laughs> not that I should say that on the camera, but I just did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, and by the way, we just came from work. Oh, yeah, we did. So we are disgusting. I mean, I these aren't dirty beers, but it's like a dirty interview. It's a dirty, in a... it's dirty lattes, though. We did stop in. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All so, right, so I've I'm got wine try. chilling back at the tent. I didn't, uh -huh. should have brought that down. <laughs> Wait, now I'm going to see if it's still recording. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, good. All right. Uh, I just got paranoid while we were talking. I was thinking, man, you have to do this again. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, let's see. Oh, contra all right, so question two is contracts. Mm -hmm. Like, what are those? I mean, obviously people kind of know. Well, the contract is the result of the proposal. Yeah. Um, some companies have uh, standard contracts that they write up based on, based on the job, and they'll have the client sign yeah. that. Um, that's when you hear the words signed contract. That means everything's on the up and up and ready to go. Yeah. Um, if it's a agency job, then after that, you'll go to the agency and say, we're ready to go, let's get a notice to proceed or a field work authorization or whatever that agency calls it. Oh. Um, some clients, some bigger clients will come back to you with a contract and you sign their contract and then yeah. they sign your contract and everybody signs everybody's contract so all the lawyers are happy. But basically <laughs> all the contract does is reiterate what was in the proposal. Um, it could be that there's some changes back and forth, like yeah. if you send in a proposal and they're like, well, we like that, except make some of these changes, and then you make the changes, you sign it, you send it back, they sign it. What kind of changes do they ask for? Uh, they could ask for timeline changes. They could say, uh -huh. you know, you wanted to do uh, 25 radiocarbon samples, that's what you're billing for, but we're only going to let you do 15, or uh -huh. I don't know. You know, it, it could literally be anything. Um, I mean, if you can argue your point yeah. and say, listen, this has to be done, otherwise, what's the point? Yeah. Then maybe they'll listen, but obviously the client has uh, financial restrictions as well. Yeah. So, you know, unless it's the federal government, they don't have an endless supply of money. So, well, apparently it's federal government here, or I guess they're not federal. They're, they're very much not federal, and it's very <laughs> different. You know, we're, we're working for a county, yeah. and counties go bankrupt. Well, they do all so, the time, but they yeah. get out of it. Yeah, well... <laughs> You know, they have they had very limited funds, especially in a county like this. It's yeah. a fairly rural county. I don't I'm, I don't know how what the population is here, but yeah. half the county's taken up by a huge lake, which nobody can actually live in. So you can live around it, but so on the contract, I mean, basically, it's just a reiteration of the proposal. I mean, that's what's in it. That's where it starts. Yeah. yeah if there's any sort of uh, like, what do you write into your contracts? Well. That's where you're, that's where a lot of your assumptions go, um, and by assumptions I mean you put all that stuff at the end. You're like, because there's I mean archaeology, as as anybody who's ever done archaeology yeah. knows, you can say like <laughs> let's say you're out to do a a, a survey of two thousand acres, yeah. you can say based on background research, preliminary background research, that you're going to find fifty sites. Um, <laughs> that's an intuitive guess. Yeah. You're you're it's an educated guess. You're going to find fifty sites. And if you're wrong. And if you're wrong, you have to put that in your assumptions because you signed a contract that said, listen, this yeah. is what this survey is going to cost. You put in your assumptions and say that's based on finding 50 sites of this average size and complexity. If we yeah. find something beyond the scope, they say, yeah. beyond the scope, then you're going to have to go back to the client and um, renegotiate the contract and uh -huh. put in what's called a change order. Um, oh, some companies will will <laughs> some companies that Richie and I have worked for <laughs> will put in a uh, uh, a low bid on purpose just about just to win the contract and then almost inevitably put in a change order. 
Um, and they'll also write into their contracts, uh, some of the bigger companies will, that, yeah. and I think this is fairly standard too, actually, that, you know, no change order is required if you're less than 10% over the budget. Ah. So if it's a $100,000 contract and you go to 110000 if the client signs it, then no change order is required. And some companies will always go into the 10%, <laughs> always, because they underbid. So... Well, don't um, forget, 40 acres every day. <laughs> 40 acres, you better get walking. <laughs> don't find anything. So, Oh, man, that's like a project I knew in Southern California. Mm -hmm. They bid it for 50 sites, but they ended up finding 800. Uh, that's a little bit different, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the client was not very happy on that one. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a clear case of somebody who didn't know what they were doing. I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a big difference. But if you bid it for 50 sites and you find... 55 or 60 that's a pretty good estimate yeah. you know if you bid it for 50 and you find 100 or 200 that's a bad estimate yeah. um, sometimes you can't help it because sometimes sometimes no surveys have been done in the area yeah you've got to do some more research and by the way all that research that you do for the proposal yeah all that cuts into overhead nobody oh. pays for that uh. nobody pays for that you you could do you could do days worth of research for a proposal and that's completely taken out of overhead I mean, research, you know, what kind of research? Well, in Nevada, you would look on Nevcris, um, yeah. which is the site file system online. Yeah. Um, typically, people aren't going to actually go to the BLM district and do a lit search until they sign the contract because uh -huh. that costs a lot of money. Yeah. you got to send somebody down there. You've got to get authorization from the BLM. They might not even give it to you without actually having the project. Yeah. Um, you can call the BLM district and say listen I've got a project coming out in this area have there been any recent surveys that aren't in your system yet yeah that you know about and that they found and you can do research that way oh, so you can't just stop by for fun and say I want to look through your records uh, not typically no <laughs> they they require advance notice and a reason oh. so um, you know they, uh, they they hold those records pretty closely pretty tight yeah so um, that's generally the basic research that people will do yeah. um, Depending on the area, you know, yeah. you can do more. There's other websites and historical background things you can check and yeah, stuff like, like that. Yeah, you know, GLOs and... Yeah, and you can check all stuff. kinds of stuff. It depends on what area you live in. Sure. Um, sometimes the Sanborn maps, you know, for oh. like old, you know, towns and city planning and stuff yeah. like that. Um, doesn't Those don't really apply in like <laughs> the middle of Nevada. Yeah. It's really the old GLO maps, the yeah. government land office maps. Um, so And GLOs don't apply in like North Dakota. Right, right. <laughs> like, right. like that. Yeah, and most of the East Coast. So, Wait, so what kind of... Uh, Wait, what kind of contracts are there, though? Like, you know, categories. Well, there's two basic ones. Yeah. Um, you've got a fixed price contract where you say, I'm going to do this contract for $50,000, regardless yeah. of what we find. Yeah. And that's what you're going to pay me. And yeah. if it if it costs you, you know, less than that, then, then they're still paying 50. If it costs you more than that, then you either got to do a change order or uh. Uh, you just lost money. Um, and then there's time and materials. Yeah. Which, time and materials on a big job um, is probably not very likely because, uh, I mean, it could spiral out of control in a hurry. Because <laughs> time and materials is exactly that. You're going to say, well, I think it's going to take about this long. We'll find about this much. Yeah. But I'm going to bill you on a cycle. I'm going to bill you monthly or oh. something like that. And then the client presumably yeah. will pay out on that same cycle. You oh. know, So you'll invoice them after 30 days. Or at the end of the month, yeah. then they've got 30 days or 60 days or whatever their time yeah. frame is set up oh. in the contract. They'll uh, pay you on that schedule. So, yeah, yeah, those those would be pretty rare <laughs> for a really big project Are because they? well, the client likes to know how much it's going to cost. Oh, so where do you find them? Well, I mean, I, I've done them on uh, smaller contracts oh. uh, like cell towers and stuff like that, where they know that even at time and materials, it's not going to cost more than say fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand yeah, dollars. They only like what takes a day. <laughs> well, it just that. depends. You know, the the actual the actual per field work takes a day for like a cell tower, but oh. it can depending on the project. Like I did one on the UNR campus a few yeah. months ago, and oh. uh, part of the visual. Um, AP for the cell tower went yeah. into a historic district on campus. Oh, right. So I had to do research online and research at the campus about that, and that was about a day or two of research, <laughs> and I had to write it up. Uh. So, um, you know, that took, that whole project took, even though it was just one cell tower, it took like three or four days um, oh. to do the report writing because of the background research. So Yeah, but when people think of their improved cell coverage, <laughs> it's probably worth it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why those things aren't very cheap. I mean, one... <laughs> 
one stupid little tower on a on a well developed campus where mm -hmm. they weren't going to disturb any new ground, um, anything like that. I mean, that was that was almost fifteen hundred dollars. And that's not just so. for cultural. I assume they had to send in everyone. Yeah, yeah. Well, for a new tower, that's FCC Form 620, and uh, they have a lot of things they need to cover. Um, like biologist, I assume? Yeah, it's a full NEPA assessment, um, uh, National Environmental Policy Act. So, yeah. the uh, and luckily, this company didn't require me to do the full NEPA yeah. assessment. Some site <laughs> acquisition companies will come to you and say, hey, take care of all this, but yeah. they were putting all the pieces together. They were uh, organizing the different pieces and then putting it all together. So I'm not sure exactly what kind of arrangements they had. That's pretty common, um, isn't it? You know, um, you, like enviro scientists and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, they'll you know they'll usually yeah put together the pieces yeah. and just find the subcontractors. So, but there is a cell tower company out of Las Vegas that yeah. um, contacted me and they wanted me to put together the entire NEPA assessment oh. for one cell tower in the middle of Nevada. Are you gonna do it? Well, they ended up backing out. Their client oh. did. Um, but oh. that was going to be almost eight thousand dollars for one cell tower because I was doing all of it. I had to yeah. get the subcontractors for the for everything else, and I already lined up people to do some of the other stuff. The report was going to be huge, yeah. and uh, I think um, it's important to mention is that you don't make exactly make like billions of dollars. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> yeah. not exactly. There's like a huge like like a huge bottom line or a huge um, profit margin. Right, there really isn't. I mean, if you get ten, fifteen percent on a project. You're probably doing pretty well. Yeah. You know, that, and that's into profit. That's after you've made payroll. Because people so. always imagine that company owners are like super rich and wealthy. Right. <laughs> if you just want to do a little formula, um, yeah. look at the company that you're working for, see how many yeah. salaried employees they have or permanent employees. They might not yeah. be salaried, but permanent employees and multiply them by, yeah. I would say a conservative number would be about 3,000. So if you've got 10 employees, Multiply that by three thousand dollars a month. That's what that's what they're getting paid out. Plus, it's you probably, can't bring it office space. Well, I, yeah, but that's that's on top of it. Um, right. So, yeah, this is just payroll. So let's say they're making collectively on the average three thousand dollars a month a yeah. piece, and that's probably closer to four actually, closer yeah. to four thousand dollars a month um, before taxes. That's true. And ten employees. I mean, that's uh, forty thousand dollars a month just to make payroll, and then you add on. Everything else, and yeah. you're looking at fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month just to stay afloat. <laughs> and imagine how many projects you need to do to bring in that much money. And of course, you know you're like, you know, you've got winter to deal with. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, smart companies will. Uh, I knew one company in Colorado that I worked for. Yeah. They managed to write their contracts so that they could do lab work and report writing in the winter. Huh. So they actually slammed in a whole bunch of field work for about the eight months they had before the yeah. snow flies, and then. Uh, a lot of their people would, um, because they, they worked on comp time, which means yeah. everything over eight hours, they got to just bank yeah, um, and then take off whenever they wanted. Yeah, They would usually, most of them would write reports and do lab work for like November and December after the ah. snow flies. And then a lot of them would just take January and February off paid. Ah, kind of like some companies we know in Reno. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it so. makes me think, like I met a field tech who... You know, was sure she was going to be employed through the winter because they told her that even if she had to, you know, even if they had to have her reading literature through the winter, they were going to keep her employed. Mm -hmm. And so she bought a house. <laughs> it's like that. That story made no sense at all. Yeah. It just sounded like some kind of fish story, you mm -hmm. know, some kind of like bullshit <laughs> yeah. to keep her working hard till yeah. they let her go. Yep. Oh, oh fuel logistics. How do how the hell the companies pay for all the crap they've got? <laughs> well. Hopefully, the best way to do it is yeah. to save some of that profit we talked about yeah. from every project and put it in the bank. Huh. If you don't have that money in the bank, um, like I'm, I'm looking at possibly four decent sized projects this fall, and yeah. I'm going to need about a hundred thousand dollars just in the bank before money starts rolling in. Yeah. You know, which I'm working on. And uh, other bigger companies, they have. I mean, they might have half a million to a million dollars in cash in their yeah. bank account because they have to cover things like payroll and all these other things. Yeah. So, uh, and per diem, per diem's huge. You know, <laughs> you got 20 people working in the field and they're getting a hundred plus a day. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's, uh, $2,000 a day just in per diem for 20 people. So, and like that's cash. East, unless you're in the East coast. Well, yeah, if you're <laughs> on the East coast, you just, you should be saving your per diem for a trip to the West. So <laughs> if, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, I mean, all that's paid for by, yeah. by either cash in the bank or a line of credit. Uh -huh. I know companies that do a line of credit or credit cards. 
I mean, Ooh. that's that's the bad way to do it um, because obviously you're getting charged interest. You are yeah. with a line of credit too, but it's lower. Uh, and sometimes there's um, contract-based loans you can get oh. um, where you basically they're they're probably uh, they're very high interest rate, mm. but they're very short term. Yeah. So because they know that you're going to get paid within three to six months, yeah. uh, typically. So you bring in the contract and say, "Listen, I've got this hundred and fifty thousand dollar contract. Can you yeah. give me sixty grand to start?" Yeah. And uh, and you've got to pay that sixty thousand dollars back within a very short period of time. Yeah. But presumably, you're going to get a check from that contract. Yeah. So you know how do they pay for the vehicles and stuff. Well, it just depends. It's all it's all the same same money. Mm -hmm. um, either they own their own vehicles and they're um, uh, or they're renting vehicles. Either way, that's part of what goes into your cost proposal. You know, you, yeah. you, whether you're renting or you own your vehicle, if you if you're renting, then you yeah. have to put that cost in the proposal. Yeah. Um, and usually you'll add a few percent because you make money on everything you put in the proposal. Yeah. So if you're renting, you'll put that in. If you own your own vehicles, yeah. people will still write that cost in as a daily rate for their vehicle. Oh. That's another place, though, where if you already own it, that before, if, if I owned vehicles for my company, yeah. that's where I would start. If, if they were paid for and they yeah. were done, I would still put them in the proposal and charge the client for the use of that vehicle. But that's where you can start reducing some cost oh. um, to lower your contract so price. So basically, you're renting it instead of you know instead of renting it for someone else, you're the one who's renting it out. Basically, you're renting it to the client. And that's the way you pay for screen and stuff. Well, I mean, that money comes in and goes into profit. So, yeah, but I meant you know you could rent out like other equipment like that. Well, yeah, I, there's companies out there. Um, a company we used to work for had a spreadsheet that had. <laughs> uh, GPS's and radios and and everything literally everything on there um, uh -huh. I didn't see like excavation equipment on there but I, I can't see why they wouldn't put it on but basically anything that you're using yeah. um, either you line item it which means you you say okay if we're using screens and we want to yeah. cover screen repair and, and stuff like that then we'll put this here yeah. and theoretically if you're doing everything right accounting wise yeah when you get finally paid for that project you'll take that money for your vehicles and for your screens and for your GPS's and yeah. put them into separate accounts or uh -huh. at least keep track of them separately so when yeah. you do have to buy new stuff or maintain them you've got this pool to pull from so <laughs> Oh, you mean as opposed to um, a company we used to work for who would just like keep using crap? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's one of the places where people make money. They they'll bill for that stuff and then they won't actually repair it. Mm. They won't actually maintain it, and that's or they'll buy the cheapest stuff possible. Or they'll buy the cheapest stuff possible. Yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say why they would do that too. Are they doing it just to put more money in the bank, or are they doing it because of bad project management and accounting, or oh. are they doing it? You know, who knows? Yeah, so. people need their vacation time. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, I guess that's about it. Unless there's anything else I can think of, which I can't. <laughs> no, and I'm I'm sure that some people will have stuff to add to what I've said or disagree yeah. with what I've said because I feel uh, like they'll disagree a lot. They maybe. probably will, and I fully I I hope they do and put yeah. it in the comments because, you know, I've been doing. I've been owning my own company for about a year and a half now, so I by no means know all the ins and outs of, yeah. of any of this stuff. I know what I've learned and, and what I've done, yeah. and I know what's worked and what hasn't worked for me so far. Yeah, so but this is 100% more than most, most field techs know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And therein lies the problem. I've, I've got somebody I'm trying to get to write a book about the business of archaeology, CRM oh. archaeology, but she still needs to get a proposal in. And uh, uh. it would be on Left Coast Press if she does it, yeah. and probably not out for another year. But yeah. um, but it, hopefully it would cover a lot of this stuff because there just oh, yeah. isn't that resource out there. You know, I did see a book called Small Project Management. Yeah, that's why that's by Bill White. Yeah. He's on the CRM Archaeology podcast. <laughs> and But that's different. That's not it about is? proposal writing oh. and contracts. That's about managing a small project oh, from like a project, project manager. manager. Yeah, oh. exactly. Exactly. It's that's all the another show. All the, yeah, well, it's all the little logistical stuff you yeah. would need to know. So um, it's a highly recommend that book. It's yeah. uh, I think you can get it for five bucks on Kindle. Yeah. Oh, so. Well. Yeah, I use his resume book. book. Yeah, yeah, Bill's got a lot of good books. So, <laughs> William A. White, I think, on uh, yeah. on Amazon. Succinct Research. Succinctresearch.com. Ah, so <laughs> they're they're good resources and they're cheap. Five bucks, you can't beat it. God, this business is so opaque, isn't it? Yeah, like everything has to be secret. Everything. Well, everything's a competition. Like I said, you've got let's let's just take Reno as an example. You've yeah. got these companies that are, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a month just to pay the bills. 
before they even make a profit. So they've got to do that much in work every month just to pay the bills. God, it's like almost a million bucks a year. Well, now now multiply that monthly rate by the five or six big companies in Reno, yeah. and then start thinking about the smaller companies in Reno. Yeah. You've got you've got companies just in the city of Reno alone working throughout the Great Basin in Northern California. Yeah that have to make half a million dollars just to pay the bills. <laughs> half a billion dollars in archaeology every month just to pay the bills. Yeah. That's staggering. I mean, it's absolutely staggering. Well, that's the reason why it's Field Tech Central, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and other cities and other places are exactly the same. Yeah. You know, they, they've, you know, you look at archaeology across the country and all the salaried employees, and you're looking at probably, you know, 10, 15, 20 million dollars a month just to pay the bills. Yeah. Just wow. to pay all these people, just to pay the bills. Now start thinking about that from a project standpoint, and that's a lot of archaeology. And you start wondering why people are lowballing it, so they can stay in business. Yeah. So the only reason they're doing it is to stay in business and to pay the bills. And guess who suffers? The field techs. And there's no getting around that. There's absolutely no getting around that. <laughs> so, of course. But you you have two choices. You either, well, you have three choices. You can oh. get out and do something else. Ooh. You can, uh, <laughs> you can appreciate the fact that you have a job because this company is getting projects they're at mm -hmm. least paying you an hourly wage yeah um you know they're letting everything else suffer uh, yeah. and sometimes like i said sometimes that's bad accounting and bad project management and sometimes it's 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 what they're doing to survive um yeah. or you can uh you know start your own company and do it better maybe <laughs> <laughs> or do it worse and fail yeah <laughs> yeah so, huh. so Richie will interview me a year from now under the bridge that I'll be living under. <laughs> um, hopefully the lighting will be okay in my box. <laughs> that's pretty much how that's going to go. Yeah, but it'll have good Wi-Fi. I'm assume. sure it will. <laughs> I won't live under a bridge unless it's got decent Wi-Fi. So. All right. So, that's everything we collectively know. Well, Chris collectively knows <laughs> about the business of archaeology. So, thanks for watching. And, um... Hope, you know, hopefully that was fun to watch. I don't know, that felt like it was a long time. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. Cool, all right. So, um, thanks again. And that's it. Sweet. Cool. Oh, let's see, hopefully the Wi-Fi is working. I couldn't get it. Because that, really? that edge water, the...